I'm Sam Willis, the creator of Raise Comics. I am the co-creator slash writer. We are on all social medias. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and we are also on Global Comics. You can find us by typing in Raise Comics, R-A-Z-E, and you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Trey Prim. I'm the co-creator slash co-writer of Raise Comics. You can find us on all socials. You can also find us on Global Comics as well. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by two very talented co-creators of an amazing series called Rays, Sam Willis and Trey Prim. How are you both doing today? Doing awesome. Thank you for asking. Doing pretty good. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Um, yes, my name is Sam Willis. I am the co-creator uh, slash writer on the series of Ray's Comics, um, and we bring a very uh, interesting take on the zombie genre, and we try to move forward with that. I am uh, Trey. I am the other co-creator uh, slash co-writer and former artist of Ray's Comics, and then kind of to build up what he was saying, you know, we do bring some very interesting storytelling aspects, characters, and and overall uh, scenery to to uh, the comic book uh, world. What is the most misunderstood aspect about the zombie genre that people who don't follow it misunderstand? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, I would say, honestly, the tropiness of it. I don't know, I feel like people have a lot of different mindsets of what the zombie genre is and a lot of turnoffs, and we're, we're hoping to kind of uh, rejuvenate the genre as a whole and to bring people back that are lovers of all stories. And just because we are a zombie genre does not mean we cater to just zombie fans. Um, obviously, there'll be those Easter eggs in there that are cool and that zombie fans will enjoy. But um, I think there's a lot there for um, anyone who enjoys a good story. I'd also have to agree with Sam. I think it's just a lot of times I feel like folks with zombies, they put it into one category, one box. Um, but with any sort of genre of media, at one point, it's always been very repetitive. You know, if you think back to like a lot of superhero uh, pieces, it's always been seen as, you know, sort of one way. And then eventually you have very popular series. Like nowadays you have things like The Boys and like Invincible who are really kind of branching out and doing something that's similar that you know, but also kind of making it different. So I'd say, you know, that that is the biggest thing of just kind of you know, people putting zombies into one category. Well, then I'm curious, what is your favorite and least favorite zombie type movie or series? Ooh, um, so I'd say favorite zombie series, just because to, at least to me, it was just so well done was Train to Busan. Mm, yeah. um, I'm sure that's a favorite amongst a few people, but it was just, I wouldn't say it really did too many different things with zombies, but it was just, just so well done that I just have no complaints about the series or the movie, I should say. I think there's a manga for that as well, too. I'm not, oh. I'm not too sure, but I think there might be. Well, let me find out. I'll have to read that. <laughs> <laughs> Hot take, Walking Dead. And I mean, the show, I'd say after season five is where I really kind of dropped off. I've read some of the comics that I think are really good. Um, but I think it, it, at least to me, it got to a point where it was almost like Marvel, where it's very formulaic. Um, and at least to me, it got a little predictable. Um, you know, the actors did a great job of what they have, but um, I don't know. I just think it got too big or maybe too mainstream, I would say, with all like the spinoffs and just the overall way they do the show so uh that that for me is currently my least favorite i would oh. say favorite i mean i'm gonna i don't want to say the same thing as trey so i'm gonna i'm gonna go i think just for i think the character development and i think how different it was i'm gonna go with i am legend because i think a lot of like how the zombies were at least how they acted and how they just like how they were was uh really cool so i'm gonna say i am legend is my favorite Least favorite. Oh man, we're gonna divide the room here. <laughs> so honestly, I'm gonna say something that might be uh, a little bit of a hot take, but I really did not enjoy the Resident Evil, the live action ones. I've seen I've seen some of the animation movies, but uh, the live action where they've kind of just 
just did whatever and, you know, kind of just made up their own rules as far as what the Resident Evil genre was. Obviously, it's over the top, you know, but Alice wasn't even a character and they kind of just went off the rails with that one. But uh, yeah, I'd say that's my least favorite or one of my least favorites. What's the elevator pitch of the series and what sets this series apart from, say, the zombie movies and series that you just previously talked about? So um, elevator pitch for Rays, I would say a mysterious virus breaks out. It takes place in the city of, of Peekskill, New York. And we follow the main character, Bucky, who was born with a rare condition that not only gives him the ability to kind of adapt, but also bond with the said uh, infection. So you really get a chance to see, you know, is he the only one with this rare ability? Uh, are there more people like him? And then, you know, who started it? Where did it come from? And how do we stop it? So what I would say sets this apart, while it has a lot of zombie themes to, to this, this series, I would say our comic is more of what we call like a character study with zombie tones here and there. So it really is mostly about, you know, the characters that are there, the personal journeys they go through, and re really just, you know, how do people interact when they're at the end of, of the world, essentially. So you kind of hit the note, uh, or you know, kind of hit the nail on the head with that because I mean, me and him have the conversations all the time, which I think a lot of zombie shows do it, but it's 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 a thing of they rely too much on it. I think a lot of what we try to do in this series is, you know, the zombies are the background, but the characters are the are the focus of the series. As much as the zombie world and the apocalypse, I think, brings out certain aspects of the characters, um, if you took that away, you would still have these characters and you would still have them acting as rambunctious and over the top as they are currently. And I think that's something to speak upon, you know, me and Trey and how we try to develop these characters is, you know, we want people when they come in like, yeah, zombies is a cool idea but they're staying for the characters and they're staying to see what stupid or smart or crazy thing they're going to do next and i think that's what we try to excel in and i think that's what's going to get a lot of people invested in the series so what makes good characters in the in your stories um i mean it's and i've said it before it really is this thing of and I and I I give Trey all props to this is anytime we write a character, it's always this question, and he always asks me this, and it's kind of some it's kind of a thing we push forward with every time now is he always just asks a simple question is why? You know, whatever idea we come up with this character, you know, whether they're sad, angry, or whatever the case may be, it's like why? And then we can kind of go into these. I think these dimensions of these characters and be like, okay, this person's mad because of this. Well, why are they mad because of this? And you kind of like unravel the character and you kind of, you almost like relearn the character as you're kind of going through these, uh, this rendition of whatever the situation is, which, you know, is always really fun. And it's just, it's interesting to see what the outcome is going to be because it's always just, <laughs> It's always just fun. It's it's fun and ridiculous. And I think that's the point of creating characters. You know, you don't want a character who says the same thing over and over again. You want you want dimension to them. You want a feeling of, oh, I can relate to this person because sometimes I'm mad and sometimes, you know, I'm really happy. And and I think that's what makes a good character, you know? I would say it really depends on what kind of work you're doing. You know, for example, when you're doing things like live action, you know, you have an actor there who can get very nuanced with the character you know it's not just they're happy they're sad there's so many emotions in between that you can get with a live action that you can write that way but with a comic because it's just you get one image with some words there um and you get limited to pages as well the characters just have to be very larger than life i would say so you really try to make them as over the top as memorable as you possibly can and just kind of hammer into the reader that this is who the character is any, any chance we get Obviously, uh, having you both as co-creators is a wonderful experience because as you already told me, you talk at great length about this amazing genre and this amazing series that you're both creating here. Trey, you mentioned that you were the artist as well, too. You're not anymore. Like, who's the current artist? Like, what is the team structure like for, for Ray's? 
Yes. So I was the former artist for the series. When we started, we did have, well, we've gone through a few artists now. So we had an artist who was doing all the line work for us. And then, you know, we would do like the, the final inking process. Then we had a full on artist. And then, you know, we went our separate ways. We ended up losing an artist. So just to kind of fill in, just so we didn't lose all that momentum, I did fill in for an issue just to get kind of get the, the issue done. Now we have an artist who's absolutely fantastic. Vin does an amazing job. And, you know, you guys will probably see, or you've probably seen the stuff that we posted on our social medias and whatnot. I would say for me, I was just a temporary solution. We're still working full-time jobs. So, you know, I'd work a full, full job. You know, you work, you know, 11 hours a day, 12 hours a day, however long you're at work and then come home and draw. But Vin is absolutely killing it. He's so quick. He gets it right like that. He's so good with communication. So uh, I think you guys really like what he's what he's taking this project to. What was the first piece of artwork that you got back that was way better than what you had written on the page? Ooh, I think I think I know I know I know the answer to this. So this backtracks all the way back, I would say, to issue one, and it was one of the first pages where you saw the infected. And I think, at least for me, when I saw this page, I was just like completely blown away. Just like how it looked, how it felt, because it was really the first page of me and Trey have had this idea of the infected in our mind for so long. And I think when we saw that page, it was like, okay, this is something, this is something different. This is something that people can latch on to. And I think at least for me personally, that was like the moment of, okay, we might have something here. I definitely have to agree. You know, there's nothing they say it's nothing like your first, you know. So seeing seeing uh the first issue from from you know our head and we had so many renditions of the first issue to finally see it on paper. I think the first issue to me, the first like I'll say gory page was really just, you know, you take a step back, like, wow, this is actually something really cool, you know, from our head to the paper. So the issue one was probably that that issue for me as well. How does black and white make this series better than say maybe if it was in color so i think just the tone of not having color um alone can kind of set the mood for the comedy you're going for it is more of a classic take on it as well but we are also you know at least now you can see it we're also heavily influenced by you know the manga style of comics so they do mostly do theirs in black and white so we definitely want to keep that theme moving as well um, but also, at least sometimes you can get, at least to me, a little lost in color. The line work really speaks for itself and you get to really, you know, pick apart and really, you know, analyze every detail when it is just that line work. Yeah, I definitely agree with Trey on that. I mean, he's, we had, we had a lot of conversations and if people don't know, we, we tried color. We did some test pages and we looked at it and we just... I mean, the beautiful thing, the relationship I think me and him have as co-creators is we're brutally honest. Like if, if, if something sucks, we just say, it, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and we tried to release as creators because I think it makes us a lot better. We saw it as color. And like Trey was saying, I mean, even before we got into the manga style, I mean, it kind of just bridged that with, I think the black and white and the, and the gray scale before even the manga style, we looked at it and we're huge horror fans, you know, we know what the genre kind of demands as far as like, you want that feeling of you're scared. And when we saw color in our comic, it for it kind of took away from that, you know, um, at least in our opinion for our project, we wanted it to feel, you know, very dark, very gloomy, very bloody, gory, you know, just have all the, the nodes of the horror genre. And I think when we saw color, it kind of took away from that. And we love color comics. But when we were trying to do this comic, it was really like we wanted that fear aspect. You know, if you're reading this book and you're seeing all this stuff, you're like, wow, that's crazy. That's kind of what we went on, on our, on our instinct. And I think we made the right call as far as developing, you know, five issues now and seeing the black and the gray and the white. And you're like wow, this feels like a colored comic, but it's not because it's just, it's literally three colors, but what these artists can do within that area is, it's mind blowing sometimes. So how many issues are you guys going to create? Is, is there an end goal in sight? So here's the thing. 
a little background on this project is we've been to we we met in middle school so we've been developing this for a long time there is an end goal we don't know how long it's going to take because you know when we started writing this you know we had a certain like okay this is how long an arc is going to be but then you kind of have to be realistic like we're doing kickstarters now and we're seeing you know like we're lucky like we're six issues in and not a lot of creators get that opportunity we're trying to i think tell a very riveting story in a good amount of time it just depends you know how we do how people feel about these the series how involved they get it uh in this series you know we want to tell this story as long as we can but we also don't want to burn people out either so we are trying to figure out how long it is going to be i know it's a very vague answer but it's 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 something that we've worked on for i mean over a decade and we want people to feel invested in these characters and the moment they don't want to come back that's when we know we're we're going on too long so we really do want to try and tell an elaborate story in that in that slotted time unlike some billionaires that just you know overstay their welcome on social media but that's <laughs> yes, yes 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 <laughs> What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I honestly, <laughs> it's going to sound crazy. I think there's this, there's a story I often think about is, um, and, and, and it happens randomly. When I was in elementary school and Trey maybe knows this, I used to write these like horror books by myself, pretty much in class all day. There was this thing where I there was these kids in class where I would like recruit them to to draw, pretty much draw the stories I was making. I wouldn't say it was in a comic book form because it was like it was like between third and fourth sixth grade. But I just remember is one of the uh, friends I had. He was drawing pretty much like we made a silly superhero pretty much book together, and I just remember is the reaction he had like we had i think it was like maybe 10 pages maybe and these are like very messy drawings but i just remember is i don't even think he was a comic book fan but he we read it together and i just remember the reactions from him you know i put the story together he put the art together and just him kind of seeing it all together and getting really excited and i'm like okay this is cool you know, this is really cool and this is where I want to be and this is what I want to do, you know, to be in this genre and to continue to do that. And that's like my favorite thing I tell Trey all the time. You know, it's <laughs> it's it's the thing where it's someone I don't expect where I give them something, I give them an issue to read, and then they're able to tell me what they liked, what they thought was happening, what secret messages they thought we were doing because it's like once it's out to the public it's not in our possession to tell you what it is it's now your guys's thing it's it's your product so you get to digest it however you think it's supposed to be digested well not necessarily add on but just to kind of get another you know answer at least to me what was that moment is the first time i saw you know what like comic-con really was and it sounds crazy but just the concept of, you know, you have these people here who all gather in one place and they're dressed up as these characters. And they're dressed up as characters who don't exist. These are fictional people who don't exist, nothing to do with the real world. And they're just so impactful that people, you know, take the time out of their day to come dress up as them and to be these characters. And to me, that's just the most powerful thing that, you know, of all the influences we have around us today, that something as simple as you know a character in a book can really just kind of touch people in a way to where they just want to you know be that person uh to me that is that is that uh moment everyone usually asks what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice that you've ever received but what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your careers Oh man, um, I want to say for this is it's something I hear very often, but it's something I think I live by is your dream won't happen if you quit. If you just stop what you're doing and you just say, yeah, this is not working. Let me just let me just stop making whatever I'm going to make or whatever I'm going to do. It'll never happen. And I can speak personally. There has been times and Trey knows this where I want to quit, where I'm like so frustrated and I'm like, I can't do this. I need to leave, you know, even if it's only for a second. But I think the rejection and the failure and all the things that I think people worry about, uh, I think the biggest tool that we face is just 
facing yourself, just swallowing whatever is going on right now, because right now is not what happens in the future. And just buckling in and just getting the work done. Like Trey said, we've been through many artists, and there's been artists who have left halfway through an issue, three quarters of the way through an issue, and we have no control. We have to start over from scratch. And there's been many times where we're just like, come on. Are you kidding me? We just have to pick up the pieces and we just got to keep going. So I think tenacity is a huge, huge thing. And if you have it, use it and use it to your benefit because you will go places if you use it. I'm going to give you the same answer for both of them. It's, it's the best advice, but also the most BS advice. And it's going to sound controversial, but it's stick with it. And here's here's why. If it's something you're passionate about, by all means, absolutely stick with it, 100%. But at the same time, there is times where some things you do need to walk away from. The biggest thing for me is you got to find the difference between, you know, is it something I walk away from or something I stick with? And a lot of times we say it all the time is, you know, I don't care how much money I make off this project. I still want to see it done. You need to be passionate to the point where you can make zero dollars from what you're doing and you still want to do it all the same. And if that's the feeling you get, stick with it. If that's not the reason you're doing it, then it might be time to walk away. It is both the most real advice and sort of the most biased advice I've, I've heard. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? It's so it's a certain page that's in every issue, and I'm sure people have picked up on it. And this is just my personal answer. You know, I'm going to go hit you right in the heart. Um, there's a tribute page for uh, my late mother who when we were writing this was not what it is now it was it was terrible it was it was god awful and she was able to sit through it and she was my biggest supporter i'd show her all the art when it came out and unfortunately she wasn't able to see issue one the goal of the tribute page was at least if more than myself read and say her name that she lives on through the comic and i think she was my biggest inspiration had the biggest heart and always told me to follow my dreams and to never give up. So, yeah, that's my biggest hero. Well, that's going to be a hard one to follow. I kind of wish I went first. <laughs> um, I guess for me, the people who, or not one person, but really, like we said, we've had a lot of influences through like different mangas and whatnot. And that was really a lot of what I read growing up. And the thing I specifically like about their pieces of work as opposed to Western comics, no disrespect to them, is just a lot of times it is just one guy who's writing the story, who's doing the artwork, issue after issue after issue. You know, these guys were so much into their work. You know, they didn't have, you know, luckily like we do, a disposable artist they can just kind of put on the project. So, you know, some of these guys, you know, work, you know, 15 years straight to get their project done. So I always wanted to be like them, you know, like say, hey, this is our project. We've been on it for X amount of years. No matter what, we're there to get it done. So that's really what motivated me to kind of see the project through to the end. Sam, back to your thing. As long as you remember them in your heart, it's truly all that really matters. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I used to write Hallmark cards as well, too. <laughs> From a professional uh -huh. standpoint, you are both successful co-creators creating at least as of this interview five issues soon to be six and many many more in the future not with just this series but maybe others in the future as well too so professionally you're successful in that regard do you consider yourselves personally successful yeah i mean i would say honestly personally i think knock on wood on this one but if i was to, to pass away tomorrow i think you know where i've come since I was a kid and just wanting to do something in, in the creative field and going on interviews, talking about our project, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a thing I've dreamed of uh, since I was a kid. And personally, I mean, I think this is probably the happiest I've been in a long time. Um, I've got a great team and I've got a great support system around me. So I would say personally, I do feel successful. It's only up from here. Sort of. I can't, I can't give myself the full status of successful, at least for me, the way I operate. Once I give myself a title or a status, not that I don't want it anymore, but I don't feel like I'll be chasing it as much. 
to me, the chase never stops and it's just awesome thing to, to shoot for. So it's going to be a long time before I give myself that status or that title. So I would say semi-successful, you know, we have accomplished a lot. I am proud of what we've done, but I just can't give myself that status yet until we see us through to the end or at some point of me is, is satisfied fully with what we've accomplished. So at that point, we'll, we'll see, uh, we'll see how long it takes. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh, that's, that's, that's a good one too. Um, it's hard. I will say honestly, and, and Trey knows this is a lot of the times we come out with our issues. We want people to, you know, either critique it, read it and give us an honest opinion on it. And there's been a lot of positive feedback, but he knows is I think a lot of the times I think when it happens, I think it's almost like in waves where initially when I get the the criticism or the failure, it's, it's really like trying to understand it. I would say, because it's, it's, it's that thing of, I think it's not intended to make you feel bad, but I think you have some sort of representation when you have like a personal project or a creative project you're working on because you want it to do so good. You're passionate about it. And, you know, it is almost like your baby in a sense, you know, and you just want it to do good. And I think, you know, when failure happens, when things happen that you don't see coming or, you know, rejection happens or whatever, I think taking the worst parts of whatever it is and trying to shine some light on it. And as long as it's authentic, I think can help you because there has been, I think scenarios where we want a second eyes on this and we want people to be real about this project that we're working on. And if they give us a real answer on their perspective, we try I wouldn't say to implement it, but to take it in and try and figure out what we can do better. And I think that's always the thing with failure and rejection is, okay, yeah, this is this is a no right now. This is this is a stop sign that tells us, okay, we sh- we we shouldn't go in this direction. So, what other direction can we go? Is there another road we can take? And I think that's what we always try to pull out of these situations for the most part. Let's say for me, and this is probably something that maybe some other artists can kind of relate to, especially because as far as art in general, I'm not like trained or like maybe some people, I didn't go to school for it, but you really got to embrace the failure. You learn more doing something 10 times wrong than you do doing it one time right. You know, you're never really going to hone your craft. You're never really going to learn how something's supposed to work unless you fail it. Um, They're always teaching moments. um, So that I really try and embrace and learn as much as I can from said failures. That classic Bruce Lee expression, I do not fear a man that kicks 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man that kicks one kick 10,000 times, something like that. Exactly. Better way to put it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a movie buff as well, so I I get what you're saying, but I agree. Also be like water. (laughs) The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic creator or a writer, artist, whatever it may be creatively, maybe you've inspired them through Ray's comic series as it is. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I would say the most inspirational thing you can do, and this is going to sound a little cliche, but be yourself, be original, stick to your guns. It seems like a lot of times in media we have right now, people are often trying to imitate other things because they're popular, not necessarily because that there's something that they necessarily are passionate about or want to do. Being the best version of yourself or being yourself is the most inspirational thing because so many great things have come from it. Like we said, we want to be different with this series. If we just kind of did what everyone else was doing, I don't think we'd be inspirational to ourselves or anyone else. So really just kind of do you in, in a uh, very simple term. Just kind of piggybacking because I think very much of the same answer, but I think, you know, being authentic, I, I think there's a dis- difference between imitation and inspiration. I think we're all inspired by something, but I think, you know, we all come from different walks of life. And I think if you can find something that you love and to kind of branch off from it, just be passionate about it at the end of the day. It goes back to what we were saying earlier. We're not making a whole lot right now. So, I mean, we're, we're very passionate about it and... People are going to see that. People are going to see your passion. And that's, I think, what's going to speak to them more than anything. There's been, 
a handful of events that we've gone to. Once we start describing the series and people can see that energy and that passion, they're coming back to invest in you at the end of the day. So I think the authenticity of it is really going to bring people into your project and be like, okay, you know, maybe even if it isn't my cup of tea, I met these guys, they're really cool. And I really like what they're trying to accomplish in this genre. Let me see what they have to offer. And I think that's where you're going to get a lot of different people who want to invest in you and your time and your book. And I think that's what the younger generation, I think, could definitely implement in the future. Oh, but also be better. There's nothing <laughs> wrong. And I don't mean that in, in a negative way. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be better. It's one thing to be inspired by us. But if we're someone who inspires you, you should try and be better than us. And the next person should try to be better than you. And that's the only way people are going to keep inspiring the others is by trying to be better than what's come before them. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Ooh. I mean, mine would probably be comedy tragedy because there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack in my life. And But I honestly think if I had to choose my soundtrack, I don't know if it's given to me or I can choose it, but I definitely think Hans Zimmer's never done a soundtrack for a comedy. All right. <laughs> but I think, I just think, you know, if it was the right project. <laughs> he, could, he could come on board, you know? There is beauty in that in having to laugh at your own pain. So I think, if anything, it would be very on the notes, I would say, a lot like our writing. So. <laughs> That's what I think my movie would be. Probably the tragedy of Samuel Willis and, <laughs> and just make it really raunchy and really hilarious and just over the top with a great soundtrack. <laughs> I'm sure Adam Devine could be uh, could play you, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I'll see. If I had to choose a title, it would be, ah, shit, here we go again. <laughs> Because that's just my daily catchphrase. When when things happen, I'm like, okay, it's going to happen again. Here we go again. This is going to be another situation. As far as soundtrack, I'm not too sure on what that would, would sound like. Whatever music they use for SpongeBob, I probably use that. <laughs> well, that's a new one. I, I, I haven't heard <laughs> that one yet as long as I've asked that question. That's good. First. Yeah, wor world's first. There you go. <laughs> Well, Sam and Trey, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show. Of course. Thank you for having us. Yep, thank you for having us. Before I let you both go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is Ray's and anything else you'd both like to promote? Yeah, so we are uh, pretty much on all socials right now. You can follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. We're under Ray's Comics, R A Z E. C-O-M-I-C-S. Um, you can also follow myself on Twitter, which is comics underscore Raze, R-A-Z-E. If you want to come and connect with us, we are also on Globo Comics right now and on Amazon as well. You can just type in R-A-Z-E comics and you should be able to find us. What he said. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or Two Geeks talking.com that's two not the number two of course our youtube channel is a lot more updated than our website that's at youtube.com forward slash tgt media the podcast is back after 12 or so years because reasons you can find that two geeks talking .com or wherever you listen to your podcasts and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking